So welcome uh, everyone. My name is um, Juan Esteban Montes and I am the director of the Santiago Global Center. I want to thank you all for your active participation in this ongoing uh, global dialogue discussing the, the, the worsening water crisis. Uh, in the past sessions, we traveled to Nairobi uh, and Malawi, the West Coast of Ireland, the city of Mumbai, Mexico City, and London to discuss topics around surrounding uh, water. It is our endeavor to continue these important conversations discussing the worsening global water crisis by building a virtual community and connecting with all of you as a global audience to reflect upon the material presented. We hope uh, that your experience the, with this series continues to be insightful and engaging and that you are connecting not only to us here um, at uh, Think and D, but also to the global community engaged in this series. The continued, uh, continued support that this global dialogue series has received from Notre Dame uh, International, the Office of the Present, the Notre Dame Alumni Association, and the various colleges and units, uh, and units on uh, campus has been a mark of the university's commitment to being a leader in discussion about the pressing global needs of humanity. This week, I'm excited to be with you and to have the opportunity to discuss, uh, to discuss water sustainability in Chile, as well as how population growth, mining and agricultural development and climate change are increasing the need for more sustainable and energy efficient water management technologies. Chile is paradoxically a country rich in freshwater resources, while at the same time, it is ranked among the, the world's most water stressed countries. This has to do in part with the particular geography of Chile, but also with uh, its industrial activities, the legal regulations of water uh, in the country. This week, the Santiago Global Center will be in conversation with Notre Dame faculty members, member and research leader, uh, Dr. Rob Nettenberg, as well as uh, UC Chile professor uh, Ignacio Vargas and uh, their former dual PhD student, uh, Marcela Vega, all of them from the field of civil and environmental engineering. They will discuss how they came to work together on water contamination, the prospects and challenges for the uh, Notre Dame UC Chile dual PhD and the unique situation of perchlorate contamination in Chile and possible steps to mitigate its health impacts. We also ask that if you have questions uh, for our speakers today, please use the chat uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Um, this will allow us to facilitate the questions as effectively as possible. We will try and answer as many as, uh, of them as possible given the time constraint. As you may know, uh, 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 we uh, shared a few pre-recorded videos that were posted on Think and D where Drs. Nettenberg, Vega and Vargas uh, discuss a few themes related to these topics. For those of you who have not had a chance to watch them, I recommend uh, afterwards going uh, to Think and the and watching them. So let me uh, begin by introducing uh, our great friend, uh, Rob Nettenberg. Dr. Nettenberg is a professor at the Environmental um, Biology, uh, Biotechnology, Biotechnology Laboratory at the University of Notre Dame. The Nuremberg uh, Research Group focuses on biological processes for water and wastewater treatment and reuse. Dr. Nuremberg's group uh, uses advanced experimental tools, molecular tools, and modeling to understand and predict the behavior of biofilms. His research is uh, helping develop the next generation of treatment technologies and for sustainable water management. And I'm sure I am uh, missing a lot of what he does and, 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 and researches. Uh, 
So this is just a, a, a very few lines of what he, he does. Uh, Dr. Ignacio Vargas, we call him Nacho, Nacho Vargas, a uh, great friend, is associate professor and director of the uh, major in environmental engineering at the Department of Hydraulic and Environmental Engineering at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile, UC Chile, for short. His research uh, focuses on environmental engineering, micro, uh, microbial fuel cells, biocorrosion, uh, environmental biotechnology and water treatment systems also among uh, a few of the things that he, he does. You know? And um, Dr. Marcela Vega was uh, most recently a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and she graduated from the Notre Dame UC Chile dual PhD in environmental engineering, where she worked with both Nacho and Rob. Uh, she's uh, right now in the job market. Uh, so if any of you have uh, any job opportunity for Marcela, please uh, include it in the, in, in the chat. Uh, uh, she's fantastic. So you won't be disappointed. So thank you, you. Uh, to all of you uh, for joining us uh, for this conversation. And, and let me just uh, move ahead with, uh, with a few questions initial questions now for, for uh, each of you and all of you afterwards. So Rob, if I could start with you, could you tell us how you got interested in doing research in water micropollutants in general and uh, percolate in particular? And how did that research connect you to Chile and to UC Chile uh, afterwards? Well, thanks. Thanks, Esteban, for the nice introduction and thanks for the great question. I'll do my best to respond synthetically because that is actually a really complicated <laughs> question. Um, so I, I um, was actually working in consulting engineering as an environmental engineer in Chicago. And at the time, there was a really interesting problem. Chicago gets water from Lake Michigan and the water tasted and smelled awful for a, a certain amount of time. It had this musty, earthy smell and, and taste and people thought it was because of zebra mussels. And anyway, just an interesting fact. I became interested in getting a PhD also because I was really interested in biological degradation processes. So I ended up getting uh, applying and, and starting my PhD at Northwestern University. And I was really interested because I found that bacteria can degrade these awful smelling compounds in water. So that's what got me going with water micropollutants because these are actually aesthetic pollutants. So they're not a health concern, but they make the water disagreeable. Now, my advisor had a former student from Chile who was a professor at La Católica, and he was sending his students to, mm. uh, to the States to get their PhDs with my advisor. So I had several colleagues from La Católica who got their PhDs with me. So I quickly learned that La Católica has great PhD students. They were amazing. Okay. Um, now, we didn't get funding to study the water pollutants. I did a year of research on that, but then we got funding for something else. At that time, people became aware of perchlorate as a drinking water pollutant. So it turns out that um, in the US, uh, many army uh, munitions factories or places where arms were stored used perchlorate as a rocket fuel component. And I guess there was a limited shelf life after the rockets had been stored for a certain amount of time. If they hadn't been used, they had to remove the propellant and replace it. And what did they do? Well, they put it in a pit and let it leach into the ground and go away and problem solved, right? Okay, many years later, they found that this perchlorate compound is very, very stable in water. It's very, very mobile, so it can move far, far away from the release site. And also perchlorate was known to be a thyroid inhibitor. So it had health concerns, especially for pregnant women and young children. So I guess at the time that I was a PhD student, they found that perchlorate was everywhere, not literally everywhere, but they measured it in many places near release sites and found that it was very, very, very widely detected in many water sources. So we ended up studying uh, a biological process to transform perchlorate into innocuous chloride. Okay, so that's how I got into the study of perchlorate as a water micropollutant. Now, it turns out, you know, when you get your PhD, 
and you know are becoming an expert on a topic you have to read and read and read and read and learn as much as you can and one of the things that i learned um during that time was that you know yes perchlorate is very widely present in many countries because of its use in, in military facilities and also for explosives and fireworks but there was one country in the world where it was present naturally at really high concentrations and where was that chile okay so I always thought, wow, it'd be so cool to see if Chile had special bacteria that might have evolved over, you know, millions of years to be more effective with perchlorate reduction. Also during my PhD, I developed an, a special kind of bioreactor that was very effective for perchlorate reduction. And I felt that that also had many opportunities to be used in Chile or, or other places. So, okay, fast forward, I finished my PhD. I came to Notre Dame as a, a young faculty and it turns out that Notre Dame, for many years has had very close and strong relationships with the uh, Universidad Católica. They've had undergraduate exchanges and, and uh, I guess, collaborative programs, but not so much on the graduate side. So the Dean of Engineering and the Dean of the Graduate School were very interested in making connections with schools in Latin America. And I happened to connect with the Dean of Engineering and said, oh, you know, I know a lot of people at La Católica. And he said, oh, great, can you introduce me? And I said, sure. So one summer we met and made introductions and I thought that was how, um, I guess the beginning of this dual PhD program. I, I wasn't me doing it, but I think I helped at least make that initial connection. Um, so, you know, around that time I visited Chile several times to recruit students because I knew how great the students were at La Católica. And I actually took a sabbatical there. So I was there for a year with my family. And at that time I, met many faculty, including Nacho. And, you know, we had discussions at that time and later on about the perchlorate issue in, in Chile and thinking, wouldn't it be cool if we could look into this? So it turns out that because of this dual PhD, some seed funds became available. We got selected for seed funds and that's what got the, the ball rolling. Um, and I think that's where Marcela came in. And I don't know if I should go too much into Marcela, but she's the one who really made this connection happen. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rob. That's that's fantastic. And that's a great story. You know how Perkler got into uh, us into a dual PhD. You know, and uh, that's something that nobody really knows. But uh, that, uh, and we are very grateful for to Perkler, you know, for for bringing you to Chile and, and developing this uh, friendship. So beyond being a, a, a water pollutant, it's a creator of, uh, of collaboration and, 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 and institutions. You know? So uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. I, I never knew that we owe it to, to Perkler, but that's fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. So Nacho, if I could go with you, uh, how did you envision that Marcela, as, uh, 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 as a grad student from Chile, could help you and would be able to benefit uh, from both universities and help address the percolate problem in Chile? What were you doing at that uh, stage and how, how did you get her involved and, and, and you yourself uh, with uh, Rob? Sure, sure. Well, thanks, uh, Esteban. And and yeah, that that it's an interesting story too. Uh, I, I, at first, I, I want to say that one one thing that Rob mentioned that the academic level of our engineers or our uh, grad students is, is very well. So uh, they they usually perform well in American or uh, European universities. So they participate in exchange programs and, uh, or has grad students. So. At that time, uh, Marcela had this biotechnology engineering background uh, with good communication skills, including good English level. And she always, she always, I say, maybe Marcela get, can say something about that. She always expressed the idea of participating in a, in a project that had some social and environmental impact. So at that time, we we're, were talking about perchlorate, you know. So perchlorate occurrence in Chile, is, is, it, it was and it is now an emerging challenge, uh, not only associated to the identification of perchlorate in our water sources, but not, not, not only in the Atacama Desert, but also in the in cities, you know, it's, it's in the north and the central part, part of Chile. But also uh, with, we began with the idea of uh, having a solution. You know, there are solutions in developing water treatment processes that can be scaled uh, in, in cases of complex water matrices, like, like the one that we have in the north of Chile. 
So the Marcella, uh, this is what I say conceived in this framework with our SIP uh, grant, with this precarious issue, and of course with her background, uh, her hint interest in participating in this uh, PhD, dual PhD program. So I think at that time, we just visualized that Marcella work would help us to strengthen our collaboration, bringing new questions, you know, some uh, energy and expanding the original plan that we had that was the, 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 the seed fund grant, um, but into a long-term relationship. I mean, in long-term collaboration that, that with, I thought that five years, you know, maybe 10 years, now we're reaching like a decade of collaboration. So it, it was very successful. So um, I say th this opportunity of expanding the training uh, for, Mar for Marcella was, was great for her, but also was perfect for, for me. I was just starting my, my work here in Chile in Católica. So it was a very good problem related with our nature uh, using microbes. So it was, was just a, a good idea. Um, and I think that that idea helped us to to extract, to, to have a, a very good collaboration with Rob, um, not just to record it. I say now it's more than that. Uh, in other topics related with water, microbes, sustainability, and Rob has been part of uh, some thesis committees of my other students from my lab. Uh, we organized some seminars in Notre Dame, in Chile, in Catolica. And also we talked with other colleagues in both institutions to have new, new collaboration. So I said what's the, maybe just not just for glory, but I, I say more was the, the, the enthusiasm of Marcela to, 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 you know, to expand this initial problem, initial uh, research question into what we have now that is a very complex and rich uh, research collaboration. So I'm very thankful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Nacho and, and Rob, for, for creating all this network uh, of, uh, of opportunities and of collaborators and, and bringing new generations to, 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 the, to the playground of, of, <laughs> of science here. So Marcela, if I could uh, ask you, how was it for you, this experience and opportunity to work on percolate contamination and at the same time to get to do your dual PhD at uh, Universidad Católica in Chile and uh, Notre Dame and to get to work with these two wonderful professors? Yeah, yeah, well, this was like, uh, well, a great opportunity and it was my first approach to do something related to uh, contaminants in water. And actually, I didn't know about the existence of perchlorate before talking to Ignacio. So um, yeah, it was great to learn about it and to be involved in a project that, that was related with, with my country because I, I wanted to, um, I mean, I knew that I wanted to do something abroad, but, but I also knew that I wanted to come back and work with something here. Um, and also, well, the, the working at PUC, it was, a new challenge because it was a different uh, knowledge. I mean, there was a different yeah, uh, knowledge to learn um, compared to my background. So I learned a lot of new things there. And then when I moved to uh, Notre Dame, it was, well, a different challenge and learning this new technology, the membrane biofilm reactors. Um, so I got the chance to work with those uh, reactors that we did not have here in Chile. So um, that also was kind of new at that time. I think now some people is working, some former students from Rob uh, are working in Chile with that. Um, but yeah, for me, it was, was a, a great opportunity, um, both for research and also for like a personal growth. Um, you know, get, going to another country and get to know different people, to know different um, ways of doing research. Uh, was was very good and also working on something that is still relevant in Chile um, because of this particularity that is like a natural source of perchlorate. Thank you, Marcela, and uh, that's uh, it's great that you got this opportunity and got interested in in in, in perchlorate and water pollutants. We we really need that research in in Chile for 
for all us, of us who are here and drink that water, we really need solutions. So we, <laughs> that, that we, we, we better have a, a, a cleaner and safer water for not just for us, for drinking, but for agriculture and, 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 and food production. Uh, so thank you yeah. very much. And, and I really hope you get to invite other young uh, friends and students like you to participate in, in this uh, in science in general, but, but in general, but, but also in, the, in particular in this dual PhD. So Rob, if I could back, uh, go back to you, uh, could you please explain us uh, a little bit more about how this percolar contamination relates to water sustainability more generally uh, in parts of Chile and in other parts of, of the world? Uh, I, it, I, I'm not sure how the rest of the audience here is in terms of, uh, of uh, knowledge of science, but I am a complete ignorant. So uh, uh, I am assuming a few, at least, of the others are also quite ignorant about this. So if, if you could explain us a little bit more. Uh, well, I, I guess the concept of sustainability is complicated. So I think, you know, when we talk about how things affect sustainability, probably we have to know what we mean by, by sustainability. But I think, you know, I think you can look at water and sustainability at two, two, in two ways. Like one is water quantity. And if we're using water in a sustainable way, that means that we're not depleting the sources of water. So for example, if we're drawing water from the subsurface, from groundwater, and we're extracting it faster than it's being replenished, then the levels drop further, further, further. It gets harder and harder to pump it out and eventually we'll, we won't have any water. And that happens in many places. And then there's also the issue of water quality. So that means is the water going to continue to be useful for whatever purpose you, you want to use it for? And I think when we're looking at drinking water, you know, it's definitely a concern. So, you know, as, as the population on the planet increases and increases and cities get larger and larger, I think our impacts on the environment also get larger and larger. And, you know, we were constantly using new, um, you know, chemical products to produce food um, on agricultural lands, pesticides, and, you know, we're also using more chemical project products in cities and, you know, pharmaceuticals and cleaning products and industrial products, and they might get flushed down the toilet and maybe aren't removed in a treatment plant. So all these things are, are adding pollutants to our water. Now, I, I am very interested in this topic on one hand, but I don't want to alarm people and have people say, oh my God, I can't drink tap water anymore because there's all these things in my tap water and I'm going to die if I drink these things. And I would say, no, I mean, that's not the case. I, I drink tap water at home. I drink tap water at work. When I go to Chile, I also drink tap water. And I think it's possible that there's some contaminants in the water that are present at low concentrations. And I think we should be you know, interested in, in studying that and seeing what's there and what the impacts are. But I think in the overwhelming majority of the cases in, you know, countries like Chile or, you know, the US or, or Europe, the water is, is safe to drink. You know, the risks of drinking bottled water might be as high or, or you know, the impacts on sustainability might be worse for drinking bottled water. So I guess I just want to say, don't be afraid of drinking your tap water because it's not going to kill you except in very, very rare, rare, circumstances and maybe in countries where there isn't good control over water quality. But at the same time, I think we have to be aware that we are impacting our water resources at the micro pollutant level. And, you know, we need to be a little bit careful because some micro pollutants could be a problem and can increase some risks. So I think we have to be aware of that. And, and you know, I guess researchers need to to explore things and see what are the effects of these small concentrations of contaminants. So I hope I haven't confused everyone in the audience. I personally think that those risks are very small and that we don't need to be alarmed or, or worried or stop drinking tap water. But I think we also need to think about what we're doing and, and make sure that we're protecting our, our drinking water sources and you know treating the water the way they need to be treated to keep us, to continue mm -hmm. to keep us safe. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. That That's. That's a relief. No, uh, I generally drink water very uh, uh, peacefully, you know, and happily uh, from the, the from the tap, no tap water, and, and I never actually buy uh, bottled water. And 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 generally, I think uh, 
water seems safe and tastes good here. So I, I in, no matter how much perchlorite or other things they might have, uh, it, 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 you don't realize. So, and probably it's, it's I, I don't, really don't know what the quality of, of water in Chile generally is. Uh, I know in the, in the North, uh, it has much more problems than in, in the central and southern part of Chile, but uh, I don't know if you have a, an idea of how uh, uh, polluted is water, for example, in Santiago or any of the other big cities compared to other major cities around the world in the US or anywhere anywhere else. Any of, any of you? I, I've heard uh, there's some arsenic problems in some locations, is that right, Nacho? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the quality of water sources is different. You know, we have groundwater, superficial water from rivers, and, and if you go to the north, you have more arsenic problems. And in, in general, uh, minerals, you know, we live by the, the, the Andes mm -hmm. mountains. So we, we have the whole mm -hmm. periodic table in our water, but that, that is a challenge for, uh, for, for, for developing technology, I think now um, w water is, is, should uh, uh, get some standards to be uh, released into to, to people as tap water, drinking water. So I, I think the, 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 the problem is not the, the tap water, the quality of tap water is more than in the, the processes that are required to get that level and how to get that level with less energy and you know less cost and and also exploring new sources for water when you have less water availability and then we talk about that that later but that's just a new challenges uh, come up so that, that that's the kind of situation that now we're we're living okay thank you thank you yeah we we i'm going to ask you a little bit more about that but Nacho, could, uh, how, how do you envision your uh, future research on water perchlorate contamination and how could this research continue to be done in, in collaboration, particularly with, with Notre Dame and, and, and others maybe, uh, uh, yeah. but it, it, how, how much more can you do on perchlorate in particular? Is it a field? Is it a small field? Is it a huge field? Is it, is it a small problem? Is it a huge problem? Is it, is it uh, something that could, uh, I don't know, bring about a lot of research in the future or, or not so much? For sure. It is an amazing world of the perchlorate, you know, and you have different questions and challenges, as you mentioned. The first that we, our research on perchlorate and water contamination uh, will aim to first characterize the occurrence of, of this contaminant. It's not just chloride, it's perchlorate, it's also chloride and other uh, similar contaminants in our water <laughs> sources in the north. But also we are bioprospecting for microorganisms in those contaminated areas, extreme environments. So this original idea that uh, Rob mentioned, uh, we are looking for those microbes, uh, microbes that can remove this uh, perchlorate in hard conditions. And, uh, and that research will help us to understand the biogeochemical processes that control the, you know, the release and the fate of perchlorate in the environment, but also are needed to develop these biotechnological solutions that Rob are developing and also we, we also have some uh, projects about that. So there, it will be different technologies. In our case, I say biological uh, treatment processes, specific aimed to remove perchlorate, but in a, in, a, in a context where we have other pollutants, not mi micro pollutants. So um, we're looking for something that would be specific but also that can be general in terms of uh, resolving this issue, not just for one community, that could be used everywhere. So uh, we're continuing discussing about research ideas, uh, opportunities of collaboration uh, related to biological perchlorate removal, but also other water issues like you know, arsenic in water, or other challenges that we have now in our water infrastructure. We, we're talking about that, how uh, climate change impact 
uh, you know, water, um, water sources, but also the, 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 the piping of water, the bioinformation. information. Uh, so microbes are everywhere. So we have to lead with that. And in some cases, they are, we, we can use those biofilm in, in treatment systems, but sometimes are not good. And that can produce some uh, uh, sanitary issues too. So I think uh, we're moving in, or our research is, is, is uh, expanding as well as when we're having new questions because we have you know, new machines that can detect new contaminants. So this concept of uh, safe water is, is changing, is moving, and society is requiring requiring for for a better quality of you know everything. But one of those those is, is water. How how important is or how necessary or how mandatory? I don't know what what the right word would be is for uh, uh, either of, of your universities, no, uh, of our universities, uh, Universidad Católica or. University of Notre Dame, just on a, as an example, to work collaboratively with others, you know, with other universities around the world, in this case, these two particular universities. How, how far can you get by yourself or how uh, necessary really is to, to, to collaborate? Uh, how big of an impact has, uh, or what is the big difference uh, if you collaborate rather than if you don't? Maybe Marcela can answer that question. <laughs> well, any of you. Well, for me, I think our collaborations are key to make research successful. I mean, uh, you need different people and I mean, you need different backgrounds uh, to solve the problems that we're facing today. Um, and well, I don't know, well, maybe I, I think for our country, Chile, that is kind of a small, uh, I think for us, it's like, very relevant to have more collaborations uh, with other people, maybe having uh, new technologies that, that we don't have. Um, but I guess in, in every environment, I mean, in every university, uh, collaborations are, are good. Uh, they are gonna allow you to make a broader uh, research and to, yeah, to reach more places. Thanks, any, any of the others could add something from your standpoint? Uh, I just want to want to mention that the research is collaboration. I mean, you you to to have good ideas and good solutions. As as Marcela mentioned, you need different uh, point of view, backgrounds, and also different contexts. In the case of Chile, we have beautiful natural laboratories that give us you know good pictures, but also some problems and opportunities. Um, and in the case I said U.S., you have the same and also some experience, um, infrastructure. Uh, we, we can use that as collaboration and to, to take advantage of the, you know, Rob is an expert for, let, let me say, a couple of decades of research on perchlorate, maybe. And yeah, so so that is something that that. that we have to use to, to solve this issue to, in, in Chile. Uh, it, it, it's not just for, 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 for you know, Chilean communities, it's for the understanding of, of what is the chemistry, the biological processes of perchlorate. And you know, now perchlorate is even in Mars, so it's everywhere. So it's, it's not just uh, solving the, 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 the problems that we have now, but also it will be problems in the future, what we, we can, you know, treat or bioremediate the Martian soil to grow plants. You know, it, it, it's, 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 it's that kind of question that we have to make and solve. I just want to add one thing, you know, I think the universities in Chile are, are really excellent. So they, they have a very high standard. Going to visit universities in Chile is like going to Europe. I mean, it's, it's not below the U.S., I, I think. So when we say collaborate, it's not like, oh, you know, we're in the first world and we're helping out the people in the third world who really need. No, they're, they're really at this level that, that we're at. I think the collaboration is the same as collaborating with someone else here in the States, which I think is great. I think, like Nacho said, you know, by collaborating with someone, you're broadening your 
capabilities. You're bringing in expertise beyond what you know. If you just play by yourself in your lab, you know, you can only use the tricks that you know, but if you work with other people, you bring in all new opportunities, tools, uh, ideas. So I've had a, a wonderful experience collaborating with, with Nacho and other people at La Católica, and um, I, I think it's really broadened the, the, the things that I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, if, if I can, uh, could continue with, uh, can continue with uh, Marcela, C can you please tell us uh, uh, what we, citizens and scientists and companies and governments, uh, can do to solve this, not only percolate, but uh, specifically percolate, but also micropollutant uh, problems, in, in, especially in the north of Chile? Is there anything we kind of normal people and probably regular companies uh, or whatever government uh, should be doing? Uh, or can we do something? Uh, what did you learn from your uh, research? Yeah, well, I guess I also am going to split this because it's a little bit complicated. So I'm going to start first with the case of perchlorate that is uh, more easy to talk about. Um, in that case, I think, for example, is a combination of um, Uh, the different entities. So in Chile in particular, I think we, like the scientists are the ones that have uh, showed the problem with perchlorate. And then um, hopefully the government will take a step on it and it will um, um, make a recommendation level like in other countries. So in a way that you can enforce companies to treat perchlorate because otherwise companies are not going probably to spend more money to treat a, a contaminant. Um, now with other pollutants, well, this is not the case for perchlorate, but for other pollutants, yeah, I guess we can try to care more about, uh, I mean, be more careful on what we use and what we are throwing to our water, like when with anything that we, we use. Um, probably trying to avoid uh, using uh, compounds that are contaminants, that we know that are contaminants. But that's something that we get to know first with research, right? Like researchers are the ones, or, or even government entities are the ones that are, okay, we are detecting this contaminant and well, this, is this a problem or not? Because of course, if it doesn't harm the environment or human health, probably it doesn't matter anyway. So um, we need to get more knowledge about uh, these different compounds. And well, it's very hard, I think, too, because we are always creating new compounds and we still don't know how they affect. So, so probably maybe we should do that on a different way, like testing if that compound can be harmless or not, uh, and then release it to, to the market. Um, Yeah, I don't know if someone wants to compliment this. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Let me just follow up with a with a question. Have you found any bacteria or any biological whatever uh, something? No little bug that uh, eats perchlorate or transform perchlorate or so in uh, have you uh, been able to uh, because you have mentioned a few times now that uh, one of the reasons why Chile was probably interesting and in, Uh, uh, in this sense is because uh, perchlorate contamination has been here for, for millions of years, you know, and probably some bacteria or some other uh, 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 bugs you know, have been able to, to manage how to, to, uh, to process that uh, contamination. Yeah, well, I think not just the one to answer that because I, I started working on that, but I wasn't very successful. And, but I think one of Ignacio's students uh, did found some bacteria from the Atacama Desert. I think Ignacio. Yeah, but we, 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 actually, we actually have, we actually have some uh, bacteria that can, that can, as you say, transform perchlorate. Um, and they, they reduce, they don't need perchlorate, but it, it, they can be removed from, from water. So, Yeah, that, 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 the, the question is how, how they, they can perform in a, in a reactor, uh, are there different water quality conditions, uh, and that we're testing that. Um, we're using those microbes in our bioreactors. Uh, 
yeah, but we have we have someone, and someone in the audience are interested in that. We can talk about. Yeah, yeah that's great. Great, Rob. You wanted to say something. Well, I just wanted to say, like one of the great mysteries, I, uh, initially when people were studying perchlorate degradation biologically, is the fact that so many bacteria are able to use perchlorate as food and transform it into chloride. Chloride is a component of table salt, so it's innocuous. So why would so many bacteria be able to use perchlorate if it was an anthropogenic contaminant that only existed for, let's say, 100 or 150 years? Why are they everywhere? And they are everywhere. Like, it's really easy to find bacteria that use perchlorate. Um, and people later discovered that there are trace amounts of perchlorate um, everywhere. Like, it's pro probably formed by uh, atmospheric processes like sea salt and solar radiation may form perchlorate and it forms at very low levels. But in the Atacama Desert, where it's so arid, that sea salt maybe, or those sprays may have accumulated over many years and created the high concentrations. But the interesting thing is that, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of regular perchloric producing bacteria, but Nacho found some very special ones that had very special capabilities. So I think that's really interesting. And those came from Chile and that Atacama region, I believe. Well, that's great. That's great. Let me go to, to, a, to a question uh, coming from, from someone in the audience here that relates a little bit uh, more or less with this. No? So the question goes like uh, as this, no, generally groundwater as opposed to surface sources is considered safer as a drinking water source in uh, many regions. Is this generally true in Chile where you have uh, pristine sources and high altitude isolated sources? Any, any of you if could answer this? Uh, maybe I can share some ideas here. Uh, I think that it could be right uh, in cases where we have, you know, rivers exposed to some industrial or even urban areas. But also we have some groundwater contamination due to, you know, agriculture, the use of fertilizers and, and some changes you know, in the, in the, in the levels uh, um, destruction of, of groundwater due to climate change and also some geochemistry related with arsenic make the groundwater quality not as good as we expect in some areas. So general industry here tried to mix water from surface water and groundwater. Um, and now we're experienced um, uh, problems with the availability of water. So they have to change the sources. So I say yes and no, depending on where you are in Chile. If you go to the south, you know, as the Patagonia area, probably you get good quality everywhere, groundwater, superficial water, but maybe in the north, depending on the, the natural chemistry, you know, geothermal sources, arsenic, sulfur, you know, volcanic areas, you expect not that good quality, even in groundwater and in superficial water. So that is, and, and, and so you have, we have mining activities there. So it's like everywhere. You, 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 you can have natural and anthropogenic contamination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and that brings me to, to, to another question though. Can any of, of you, because in the introduction, I and that's something I kind of made up, I'm not sure if it is true or not really, but it, it seems to me that, uh, uh, that Chile is kind of a, a paradoxical country in the sense that uh, it, Chile is both very a, a, a country that is very rich in freshwater resources, mainly in the South, you know, but at the same time, it is ranked among the, more, the world's most water stressed countries in, uh, uh, in the current circumstances now of, 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 of uh, global crisis now of, with water and, and climate change and all that. Is, is that true that Chile is both rich and poor in terms of, uh, of water? I say yes. I mean, Chile, Chilean geography is so diverse. You mentioned at the beginning of this conversation and the north and center of Chile are arid or semi-arid climate. So uh, we have more than a decade of drought um, that compromised, you know, water availability, water infrastructure in three quarters of Chile. So it's, it's, it's not the same. Probably you recognize um, as the picture that we, we have here that with the Patagonia, with rivers, glaciers, you know, lakes, 
but that is the south and and even there we are uh, we are uh, having some issues due to climate change but in the north and in the center part of chile we are affected for, for water scarcity and that becomes a challenge for for cities as the big cities are santiago but i say especially for rural areas rural areas that, that, that are not connected to the grid, that they have problems of uh, or not availability of, of drinking water. So that, that is one of the issues that we're having here now. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anybody wants to add anything to that? Well, just one little thing that uh, in some areas are affected, but this is more political ideas <laughs> because of uh, who has the water, the right of the water, because here you can sell the water uh, to anyone. So there is this particular area in Petorca where the people that grow avocado has owns the water. So the people in the communities don't have water, but the avocado trees do. So, and that's what, I mean, they get to uh, earn money with that, right? So, so that happens, of course, not all, not in every, uh, places, but but yeah, in some locations we have that problem too. Yeah, let, that brings me to to a very debatable, uh, very very important debate that we are living in Chile now. No, as, as probably uh, people in the audience knows, no, Chile uh, after a deep social crisis in in a couple of years ago, now in October 19, uh, 2019, is undergoing a constitutional transport transformation, no? and a constitutional convention is currently crafting a whole new constitution. Uh, and one of the topics that seems to have a significant consensus to be included in the new constitution um, is the need to change the current uh, water regulations, uh, uh, the laws that regulate the, the ownership and management of, of water. No? Uh, the current system allows private persons and, and, and private companies to own, uh, including buying and selling, as Marcela was saying, uh, water resources. No, uh, and, and, and the idea is to change that model by another model under which water uh, resources should be public no? and owned by the state, probably. And, and so what, what is your... I, I know you're not legal experts or constitutional designers or anything, but but you are working with water every day, and 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 uh, and, and and I'd be uh, very interested in in having your opinion about this discussion and, and how the legal regulations uh, and, and and in the case of Chile, the private ownership of water, pretty much all water in Chile is owned by private people, you know, and and companies, uh, as I understand. Uh, so how does uh, that uh, scheme of uh, regulations impact uh, uh, water sustainability and, and water availability and water quality? Any comments that you might have? Uh, I, just, I, I would say that the, 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 the access, you know, the access of water has been considered, discussed as a human right. So provision of safe water, this concept of safe water to people should be a priority over industrial purposes. Uh, this is the, it's indeed, as you mentioned, a big issue now. The, it's, but it's not just the technical part. I say that we're probably we can contribute as the scientists, as the engineers. Uh, I think it's more than that, including uh, cultural, uh, maybe ancestral uh, ways to, to you know, relate it with water. So it's more than what we can do here, but but maybe as a scientist or in the scientific community, we can contribute to this idea of uh, of safe water. That is the changing concept, you know, I mentioned before. Uh, using science and technology, you know, to having uh, water treatment processes, uh, water reuse. So we making that uh, like a real alternative for people. That is, um, for poor people, not just a rich one that can afford for a, 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 some expensive water reuse system, and also making some energy efficient alternatives to make that uh, water availability for everyone. So I think that is the call for us. But of course, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not just that, it's, it's, it's more than that. And, and it's 
something that that we need to what well, we need to include some social cultural uh, and I say ancestral because the relationship with water for, for for people that live in this territory for you know hundreds and maybe thousands of years is, is, is totally different that we that you know we, we used to use so it's we have to respect that in our new constitution, I guess. Thanks, Nacho. Marcela, Rob, something else you want to add? I mean, this is a little bit outside my expertise. My, my, my personal feeling is that, you know, mineral and water resources are, are I don't know, nice if they're, they're public goods and not private, that they can be sold or, or leased, but, but owned by the the people of the country, but again, that's just my feeling. I'm definitely not an expert in economics or, or resource management. Um, it does seem like the people should have priority for their, you know, basic use of water for living over over industrial uses. But how how to achieve that? That's definitely over my my pay grade. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Marcela, your comments as a Chilean scientist? Well, no, I mean, uh, well, same as Rob. I mean, I agree. I think, well, we all agree that, that uh, we should make sure that uh, people get water um, for the basic needs. Um, and after that, we can, yeah, use it for, for other purposes. But also, like Inazio says, uh, we are having this uh, drought um the climate change is making it harder so we need to also uh start finding like new sources of water um to 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 get uh the demand that that we have uh and well and 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 also start using it more um in a more intelligent way uh not just waste it like we're doing it now Thanks, thanks. So uh, let me go to a, another question here from the audience. We're receiving a few. Uh, actually, someone is commenting or uh, asking a question here uh, regarding this uh, topic that we're discussing now. So the question goes, or the comment goes, uh, most economists uh, consider uh, water a public good. And, uh, and it says, uh, I am surprised by the public ownership uh, history in Chile. Does anybody knows about that but they, I know it is it is uncommon uh, around the world that that uh, uh, water could be considered a public uh, a private wood uh, that can be owned and sell and bought no uh, that's any comment here but uh, they're saying at least that uh, it is generally around the world the case that water is a public good I think in the U.S. in many cases, like the groundwater is owned by the owner of the land above it, that you have a right to use that that water. So maybe Chile looked to the U.S. for their, their <laughs> model. I don't know. I, I know in other economic issues, they look to the, the U.S. historically. That, that, that is true. That is true. Uh, I, I know that Chile is a study case for that. Uh, is the books. So there are colleagues that are studying that. So yeah, I know that's a big issue, but I, I know that I know also that it's not the only place that, that maybe some states in the US have some uh, kind of issues. Yeah. And, it would be interesting if we change the constitution now and, and move from a model of uh, water being a, a privately owned resource to a publicly owned resource, how does uh, have an impact on water availability, water quality, water contamination, water use and water management, so many things now. So it will be probably a, a good study case uh, in the future now. Uh, so let me go to another question here related to, to something that Marcela was mentioning recently about uh, uh, climate change. So the question goes, how is climate change impacting the snowpack uh, in the Andes mountains both in terms of quantity and seasonal flows needed for drinking water and irrigation. I know this probably goes also beyond uh, uh, mm. your, your yeah. uh, research areas, but I think it is a very uh, uh, important question. Yeah, I, I just I just can, I just 
just beyond my 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 risk, my, my field, but uh, I say that like uh, someone that lives in, in Chile actually, in Santiago, where it's at, where you know that it's something that is happening, and we it's not just it's, it's not just the news in in, in some media is is science that, that show data that is that something that is happening, and and now we are we are having some uh, you know, actions to 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 do something something to 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 uh, to I say um, um, what's the word um, to 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 live in this this, this new scenario that what we have less water and 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 yes. It, that is something that we are experiencing now here. You can see in different areas, even in the south, in the south, what we have these beautiful glaciers, and you you can see it. That that's very impressive. I in, in my lifetime I've seen glaciers disappear, uh, and and that's very mm -hmm. impressive. You no, know? so there's no doubt. Not and and, and you, I, you don't need to be a scientist to really notice that climate change is having a huge impact in, in our water resources, at least on glaciers. No, and, and here, as, as Nacho was mentioning, um, um, the, the, the drought that, and, 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 and Marcela was, was mentioning, you know, we are suffering a drought uh, for 15 years already. And, and the level of, of the rivers flowing here in the Santiago regions is down to only about 20% of the, uh, regular previous uh, uh, level or of water, no. So that it is a huge, a huge issue for sure. Uh, from my um, very ignorant uh, point of view. Well, I, I I don't know numbers at all, but yes, I think it's something that we can see. I mean, here in Santiago, well, I haven't been much here, but but before you could see snow in the winter, like in the mountains. And now it's like very little amount of snow during winter. So like you can perceive that, that there is a decrease in, in, in water sources. Um, yeah, in the yeah. glaciers. Yeah, but Even in, also in climate, climate, climate. yeah, but climate change is also affecting areas, you know, the Altiplano areas, we have massive rain with, with floodings and, and in areas that never never uh, lived that kind of situation in the past. And now they have, they, they, you know, is we live in a changing world and that we have that kind of things that uh, in the last na lifetime, we, we observed the difference. In Chile, you can see that, you, you can see that. And the raining in this desert, the, and, and some uh, droughts in the south is it, yeah this is happening and yeah yeah it's it's very evident and very worrisome and and very i don't know uh, uh bothering and, and and visible so well unfortunately we have come to to the end of the hour and even if there are a few more uh, or several more questions actually coming also from the audience and i i'm sure uh, all of us could uh, keep talking uh, uh about these topics for, for a long time, I, I we need to wrap up. And um, so thank you, thank you very much to, to uh, Nacho, Marcela and Rob um, for this fascinating discussion, as well as for the important work uh, you are all doing in, uh, in Chile and around the world uh, regarding water uh, quality uh, and treatment. Thank you also to all of you in the audience uh, for joining us uh, today. And um, thank you for your questions and participation. And uh, next week, uh, we travel uh, to the University of Notre Dame at Tantour, uh, where they will discuss understanding water diplomacy between Israel and Jordan, another huge, huge uh, topic there. Uh, short explainer videos will be available on the Think and the website in the coming days. Please review and uh, can prepare um, to discuss next week. Also, please feel free to share the series with your friends. We are accepting registrations throughout the entire program as each meeting can uh, stand alone. 
So thank you again. Thanks. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, especially to Rob, uh, Nacho, and Marcela again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Esteban. Thank you, Juan. Thank you.